This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. start really by telling you sort of where where I hope um, will end and then I can convince you um, uh, for those of you who've been following kind of psychiatric genetics and um, uh, over the years is that I think it, it is really striking that the era of fleeting findings in all of psychiatric genetics but uh, particularly with regard now to autism uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder uh, is over so we we did have kind of a checkered past in which things would be reported and then they wouldn't be replicated, it'd be replicated in half the labs that we're trying to and um, uh, to replicate them. And, um, and I think kind of uh, reasonably it, it gave the impression that, um, that there was a lot of promise but genetics really wasn't delivering. And so through the course of the talk today, I, I'm gonna, I will focus on autism but make some comments about some parallel progress in schizophrenia and as I said, really try to convince you that um, <clears throat> that that era is over and that there is um, actually now um, a, a pretty clear path forward to do successful gene discovery uh, in these conditions. This tectonic shift, and, and really in the field I have to say it, it is, it feels like a tectonic shift. Um, uh, and, and quite a thrilling one after spending a lot of time trying to find genes and, and being disappointed uh, in the outcome, has really been a consequence of several things. So one has been uh, dramatic advances in technology, which I'll describe very briefly, um, but really the ability to get much more information out of the genome than we were able to um, uh, in the past, and to do that in a way that is, um, is uh, both um, uh, uh, economical um, and, uh, and high throughput. Um, the second has been the development of very large patient cohorts that are, uh, have, um, are willing to participate in these studies, which, um, you know, uh, is, is an extraordinary gift to scientists trying to find genes because it's turned out that the sample sizes that we need to do so successfully are much larger than we anticipated at the start of this process. Um, and it also actually reflects a real shift in the culture in the field of gene discovery in which um, uh, independent labs have really been forced over the years to, um, to combine resources and work collaboratively um, and made a, an enormous difference because uh, there really was not, we see in retrospect, the power uh, to be able to do much uh, individually. And then the final final sort of piece in the puzzle has been some methods development that has come both as a consequence now of having much larger sample sizes and having technology that works. Um, so where this leaves us, I, I think at this point, and I'm going to try to get to in the, um, in the last quarter of the talk, is to begin to talk about sort of what happens next. So now that we have this path forward to be able to identify genes um, uh, in garden variety, uh, cases of autism or schizophrenia, um, uh, what do we do? Um, and uh, and um, wh what are the major issues that we need to wrestle with now in what is, I think, reasonably um, uh, quickly becoming uh, a post-discovery era in, uh, in genetics and genomics? So uh, to start, I, I really am bringing Coles to Newcastle, and I apologize for that, but um, the, I'm not going to belabor the diagnostic criteria for autism or its natural history. What I do want to do, though, is to focus on the last three bullets. So the first is that um, certainly when I started my laboratory 17 years ago and, and um, uh, and really through, um, you know, through kind of contemporary times is that there really are few definitive insights or have been into the molecular, cellular, and circuit level pathology underlying um, uh, common forms of autism. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, it, it's hard to know exactly what to call this, particularly for this audience, because kind of conceptually, I'm removing uh, autism uh, that is a consequence of known genetic syndromes that many of you in this room have been studying now for years and years, um, and really talking about sort of for kids who come into the clinic with no uh, previously, you know, sort of defined genetic syndromes who have the, the behavioral constellation that we call autism. So uh, we've had few definitive insights in, in that group of patients into molecular, cellular, or circuit level pathology. We've got treatment 
treatments that so far do not seem to target the core symptomatology. Um, and, and the sort of um, the genesis of my laboratory, as David pointed out, I started um, really as a clinician and finished my clinical training and then went back to do a PhD in genetics with this idea, right? That gene discovery can be one avenue, not the only avenue, maybe not the most important avenue, but one avenue to understanding biology in a way that may lead to novel insights about, about treatments. And really the idea, even though, you know, when, when I started out doing it, and I think, still think even today that some people think, oh my God, total needle in a haystack problem. You've got three billion bases in the human genome and you're looking for a handful of changes that are related to autism risk. And, and that's true, but I have to say that strategically, when I was thinking about what I was going to do after I had finished my clinical training and then felt that I needed more training in science, I focused on genetics because I really felt like it was absolutely the simplest part of the problem, right? So because even when you think about what's going on in, in the brain, you've got 100 billion neurons, so, and then you've got 100 trillion synapses, right? And so when you think about 3 billion starts to become a manageable number. Um, when, when you start thinking about the complexity even just of the cellular architecture of the brain and not even considering things like development and environmental inputs and life experience and a variety of other things that shapes um, uh, how we are and how we behave as humans. So this really was in some ways a reductionist strategy. Find the simplest point of entry and then see whether or not you can pull on that ultimately to get to something that will lead you to um, a biology that's fundamental enough and important enough to, to uh, potentially generalize into treatments. And I, I'm going to come back to this because this is a hypothesis and, and I think it's reasonable to question whether or not this is, a, is really a viable strategy. That you know, you're working at one end, which may be the simplest end, but it's a very long way from the genome and variation in genome to complex social interaction and deficits in those domains that we see in, in kids with, um, with ASD. All right, so in order to, um, uh, I'm going to back up um, a little bit or take a, a, a detour and before I talk with you about the data that we have with gene discovery, about whether or not we're moving along that path and what challenges we face, I'm going to do a little bit of genetics 101. And I'm going to start um, just by um, uh, focusing in on genetic variation. So um, for those of you who don't think a lot about genetics, sometimes it's surprising to realize that if you turn to your left or your right, you are 99% identical to the person sitting next to you regardless of who that is. So I always get a few uncomfortable looks. So we got an uncomfortable look. <laughs> She's coughing, he does So um, in any case, uh, I, it's why I like sitting next to Eric Kandel. It just makes me feel better. Um, but so you, we're 99% identical at the level of the genome, right? And, and, and when you think about what, what we're doing in the laboratory, um, that gene discovery is really a misnomer because we all essentially have the same genes in our genome. There are about 21,000 genes in the human genome. And we all have essentially the same component of genes. What we're looking for is the way in which the genetic code varies between people because to the extent that there's genetic risk in a subpopulation uh, of individuals, that comes about not as a consequence of why we're similar in terms of our genetic code, but why we differ in terms of our genetic code. So we go from 3 billion bases that vary, right, down to about 1% of those that will vary between any two individuals. That's still a pretty big number, actually a very challenging number. And what you're going to see is that our strategy in the laboratory has been to reduce this down as much as possible so that we're finding subsets of variation that really dramatically separate out individuals who are affected in a subgroup versus those that aren't. All right, so genetic variation is the key. That's all I spend my time thinking about. How do I measure it? What does it look like? And how does it, and how does it um, manifest in people with versus those without a disorder, okay? So I need to tell you about certain kind of large categories of genetic variation um, because these are the ways that we sort of sort through uh, th um, the, the differences in the genome um, in order to try to identify disease risk. So the first is that, many, that, that the variation in the genome can roughly be divided into variation that's common in the population and variation that's rare in the population. Geneticists, we have an arbitrary cutoff of 1%. So if we looked at, at any spot in the genome and we found that more than 1% of people had a, had a difference at that spot, that would be considered common 
variation in the population. And if it's less than 1%, then we define that as rare. And, and the reason that that's an important distinction is that we hypothesized early on, and now that there's been a lot of gene discovery, it's turned out to be very, very well supported, is that when you think about risk, particularly risk for neurodevelopmental disorders, um, but really actually across all of medicine, that as a general proposition, things that are rare in the genome carry larger biological effects, and things that are common in the genome carry small biological effects. So um, th again, the reason that's important is that almost everything that we've done in the laboratory and that I'm going to show you has been focused on rare variation. And, and that's not because common variation may not or does not play a role in autism. And in fact, there's lots of data to suggest that it does play a role. But if you're interested in using genetics as an entree to understand something fundamental about biology and to lead it, you to treatment, then if you have a choice between finding many things that have very small effects versus some things that have very large effects, it's much easier to think about how you're going to proceed to understand the neurobiology of mutations that we find that have very large biological effects. So we focus on rare, not common variation. The second dichotomy that I want to point out for you is the difference between variation in the sequence and in the structure of DNA. So sequence of DNA is made up of four constituent parts, A, C, G, and T are the abbreviations. Um, and we've known for a very long time that the 1 percent difference that we have between individuals um, can come about or is manifest in differences in that alphabet, right? So that at one spot you may have a T and the person next to you may have a C. So the, the dogma has been that that's a normal part of uh, variation in the human population. You'll see a lot of that variation. It's not necessarily bad. Most of it is not bad. Most of it is a consequence of where your grandparents are from, okay? So, and we've known that for a long time. What we haven't appreciated until recently is that not only the letter code, but also the actual structure of chromosomes that are transferring DNA from generation to generation vary in populations. And so it, we used to think that if you had a missing, quote unquote, missing piece of a chromosome or an extra piece of a chromosome, that that de facto was suggestive of pathology. When we got the ability to look at the genome in high resolution, it turned out that that wasn't the case at all. That just like we all have some variation in the letter code of the DNA, we also all have essentially Swiss cheese genomes. So there'll be one spot where you will have no copies, and the person next to you will have three copies of that, um, of that section of the genome, and or vice versa. You can have uh, fewer than the reference genome, you can have more than the reference genome. And when that happens, if it's below the resolution of a light microscope, we call it a variation in the number of copies of DNA there, and so we call it a copy number variation, or a CNV. So in the talk, I'm, gonna, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about the contribution of CNVs uh, to autism. And, and the reason that I'm, I'm focusing on this is that this is a whole pool of genetic variation that no one knew existed until about five years ago. Because until we had tools that allowed us to look at the genome at higher resolution than a light microscope, it was just presumed that if you had a lost section that was bad, it was pathology and was, was not present in the population. And now we realize that these are present all over the place. And it gave uh, folks who were interested in autism a, 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 an opportunity to look in a place that uh, formerly had been unexplored. Okay, so we've got common versus rare variation. We're going to focus on rare. We've got sequence and structural variation. I'm going to tell you stories about both of those, sequence and structural. Um, and then the next thing that I want to talk to you about is another dichotomy in genetic variation, which is most of the time when people are talking about genetics, they think about um, uh, variation that's transmitted from generation to generation. In fact, many people feel like that's synonymous with genetics, that, you know, that, that it's risk that comes from a grandparent to a parent to a child. And it's true, most of the variation of the three um, <clears throat> million or so variations that you will find in your genome are passed from one generation to another. But also as a normal process, new variation is introduced into the genome in every generation. Um, and uh, that we call de novo or new variation. And again, that was a pool of variation that was very hard until you had really good tools to look at the genome. It was very hard to find the few spots around the genome where there would be new variation in any individual. And so it wasn't an area of major interest um, until quite recently. But now it's become, um, as I'm going to explain to you, um, an area of, of, of sort of the, the um, most dramatic advances in uh, understanding autism risk. Okay, so we've gone through common versus rare, sequence and structural, and now de novo or new variation versus transmitted variation.
This is just to give you, again, for those of you who don't spend time thinking about genetics a lot, this is just a picture uh, uh, to point out the change in the letter code. We can call it a point mutation or a single nucleotide variant or SNV, and it just shows that this letter um, uh, code is different from that letter code, and there are you know, millions of these throughout your genome. Um, and then this is a representation of what a copy number variation would look like. So um, this section C here, there are two copies present, and we'll call this the reference genome, but you can have situations in which one copy is lost, so you've got only one C here and not on the other um, chromosome from the other parent, and that we would call a deletion, and similarly, that you could have extra copies of C here, so you've got three, and we call that a duplication, and again, if this is below the resolution of what you can see with the light microscope, then it's called a copy number variation. So apart from... Um, uh, small groups of people that clustered in places like the MIND Institute. Um, most of the preoccupation uh, around neurodevelopmental disorders by kind of psychiatric geneticists early on were actually focused on common variation, which is, is an interesting thought, but it is the case. So people were focused on common variants, um, and the methodology that was used in order to find those really was a consequence of limited technology, but people would pick their favorite gene, um, typically because of a biologically plausible hypothesis, and then ask whether or not there was a common variation in or near that gene that was associated with increased risk for autism spectrum disorders. And actually that was the case for almost all of psychiatric genetics or for all of psychiatric genetics for a very long time. Um, that process as a consequence of the tectonic shifts that I told you about in terms of increased sample size, increased technology, and better methods, that really changed wholesale about five or six years ago um, to a different approach. Instead of picking your favorite gene, the approach essentially said, we're going to take a look at variation uh, essentially across the genome at every gene simultaneously, and we're going to take a hypothesis-free approach, we'll correct for all of the comparisons that we're doing across the genome, and we'll see, instead of picking a gene or a variation out of three million that might be associated, um, we're going to let the data um, tell us whether or not there, that, um, that an association comes up. And, and it quickly became the cold, the cold standard. I, I've had a cold yesterday. That was interesting. Um, it quickly became the gold standard in part because it worked very reliably. If you correct for multiple comparisons and use that as a rigorous threshold, the findings from what's called genome-wide association studies, taking the second method, were extremely reliable. From lab to lab, you find the same variation in the same kinds of populations. Um, and so that very quickly became sort of the agreed upon way in the genomics community to identify common variations contributing to, to all complex disorders, including um, uh, and common disorders. Now, so I, I'm telling you that, and then I have to tell you that in autism, that gold standard approach has now been applied, and no genes have been identified that are replicating as common variants contributing to autism. Our sample size now, everyone's getting together and doing it simultaneously, so we have samples now of about 5,000 probands and about 10,000 controls, and there is no locus. So the things that you hear about frequently, long and short um, uh, alleles of the serotonin transporter, uh, COMT, or other things that have, have been implicated in the pre-gold standard era so far have not been replicated in the gold standard era. Um, and, and I don't think that that means that common variations are not playing a role. And in fact, we and others have published papers that show that you can do an inferential analysis of the genome-wide signal and find that a very significant portion of heritability looks like it's conferred in common variation. We just don't have the power yet, even with 5,000 probands, to find a spot like that. Now, in contrast, there was very early success in identifying genes that are turning out that are highly relevant for autism spectrum disorders really along two lines. So one is the kind of work that's been done here, which is looking at monogenic syndromes that have an increased rate of autism um, uh, as, as a an, an, uh, behavioral outcome. Um, and so early work in fragile X and tuberous sclerosis and other disorders has turned out to be, to, to be very profitable now in thinking about the underlying biology of, of autism spectrum disorders. And then there were some early successes in garden variety autism um, with uh, particularly, and I don't know how he did it, but in Thomas Bergeron's lab in Paris, um, where um, a, a, a handful of labs were trying their hardest to find rare examples of very highly penetrant mutations in garden variety autism using bad tools and sample sizes that were too small. And Thomas was able to land on the right answer multiple times. So with Neuroligin 4X and 
then Shank 3 and later Shank 2. I, I, it's just, I don't know, something about being in Paris, I guess. He has all luck. All right, so. <clears throat> So the thing is, is that so there was, you know, for really you can say then uh, the first autism gene was discovered more than 40 years ago when the locus for Fragile X was identified. It clearly is a, um, a very strong risk, not only f within that population, but it turns out that biology uh, is, is highly relevant to what we're finding now. But there really was not up until about 2008 or 2000 about 2008, any kind of systematic approach to identifying genes in autism that looked like it had traction. So we are getting a sense, already getting a sense that the common variant strategy that was working in hypertension and diabetes and in schizophrenia and in bipolar disorder was not working in autism. And, and so we didn't have sort of a way of saying, well, if we get the sample size large enough, we know that if we run this assay, we're going to find genes. And that all began to shift really um, with an initial observation in 2007 by um, uh, Jonathan Sabon and Mike Wiggler at Cold Spring Harbor, where because people had been able to identify two types of things using new technology, so they were able to identify structural variation instead of sequence variation, and they were able to identify new mutation, de novo mutation, and not just transmitted mutation. So the development of microarrays allowed for both of those things, and when they leveraged that in a very small sample, and only about 100 kids with autism, they looked at kids who were the only affected child in the family versus controls and, and versus uh, families that have multiple affected kids, and found that there was a dramatic, dramatic increase in the rate of new copy number variations in kids with autism versus either of those groups. Very dramatic with regard to control, so a tenfold difference in the number of new copy number variations that were found in kids with ASD. So the reason that this was so striking, there were a couple. One is that um, there were um, only about 100 kids in that study, which is incredibly small for a genetic study. The second is, is that it was a tenfold increase in risk. When we talk about common variation, we're generally talking about 5, 10, 20 percent increases in risk. And this was a class of variation that was carrying many fold increases in risk, right? So that was tremendously important. But it left open a second really important question. So you looked around the genome and you could see in the initial study that there were spots in the genome that were lost in kids with autism, but there was no, um, but they were all one-offs, right? And so at that point, it could be that you have sort of a chromosomal breakage syndrome or something like that in which um, this is just a marker of an underlying pathology and not leading you to any particular spot in the genome that's carrying risk. But very quickly after the, that initial observation, it became clear that, in fact, these were specific regions of the genome that were being lost that were increasing risk. Because when we started to look at populations, we saw it wasn't randomly distributed throughout the genome, but in fact was lining up and lining up in a quite reliable way. Um, so there were three papers, Lori Weiss um, uh, at, at UCSF now and, um, and several others, Sue Christian and, um, and then uh, Steve Scherer's group, all essentially at, at exactly the same time, found that there was a region on chromosome 16, a 16P11, that was lining up in kids with autism. And that answered some really important questions. It, so it became clear that it wasn't random. It, it also became clear that that looked like that region was going to be quite important for autism. Um, and, it, and it also began to give a sense about a strategy for systematic gene discovery. Right? These, are, these kinds of mutations are very low base rate in the normal population, dramatically increased in the autism population, and they're, and they're falling into specific spots in the genome, right? So then you say, okay, now instead of looking for common variation, which wasn't going so well, we can take a relatively small sample of people with autism, look for copy number variation, identify families that might have de novo copy number variation and focus on that, and that may be kind of our first systematic way of identifying regions that are carrying risk. Um, now, another thing that um, I'm going to come back to and talk about a bit is that very shortly thereafter, so I love it that autism is leading the charge, because I'm going to tell you all, in every case, autism has been slightly ahead of, of the other disorders in thinking about the contribution of rare variation. But almost immediately after the discovery that copy number variation um, was playing a role in autism and that it could lead to systematic gene discovery, um, the same strategy was used to find copy number variations in schizophrenia schizophrenia and epilepsy and intellectual disability. So the strategy worked well, but the other really interesting finding was they look like the same 
copy number variations. So while we could see that they were dramatically increasing risk for autism, say 16P11, we also subsequently have found out that if you start by asking, find everyone with 16P11 CMVs, what do they have? The most common thing that they have is specific language um, impairment without any evidence of social disability. Autism is actually fairly far down the list. So they have obesity, epilepsy, um, uh, intellectual disability, specific language impairment. There are cases of ADHD. The number hasn't been quite enough to demonstrate statistical significance, and they have autism. All right. So what does this mean in the clinic? So this is just, I think, an example of how far the field has moved. Um, that now, if you, that um, this approach of looking for these submicroscopic changes in chromosomal structure um, have now become standard practice by the American College of Medical Genetics. And they've recently kind of taken a look. In 2013, they updated their, their clinical guidelines and, and went back and took a look at what their yield was diagnostically now. Now, remember, I mean, when I, those of you probably aren't old enough, but, you know, when I started in this, the idea that you would find, unless they had Fragile X or a known genetic syndrome, the chances that you could do a genetic test on a kid with autism and come up with anything was, you know, kind of a fantasy. And now, in retrospective studies, about 30 to 40 percent of kids that are being referred to uh, medical geneticists are, are getting a diagnostic you know, uh, finding as a consequence of either copy number variation analysis, fragile X testing, MECP2 in females, et cetera. Now, that number probably reflects some ascertainment bias, but we find even in research cohorts that have been selected to be sort of garden variety autism that we find a rate of about 15 percent for de novo variation that, and, and fragile X, et cetera, that we can identify. Um, so um, currently, this is mostly useful um, now for things like family counseling, but I think it gives a sense about where we might be headed, that the ability to begin to stratify for all the kinds of studies that are done here um, based on genetic findings um, starts to at least become sort of a, a sense that there might be a reality there. All right. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about um, the data that we've collected in the laboratory since about 2008. And, and the easy thing is, is basically been a single experiment on a single cohort. We've just done it a couple of different ways. So the cohort is the Simon Simplex collection. Um, and this is a consequence of Jim Simons, who's a philanthropist um, uh, in New York, who um, uh, was, um, uh, saw the, the observation in the Sabat and Wiggler paper and actually was a friend of Mike Wiggler's and saw that there was this dramatic increase in families in which there was only a single affected individual. Um, got advice that there were very few samples like that around um, the country, um, uh, and so decided that he was going to invest a considerable sum in creating a cohort um, that looks like this. So two unaffected parents in every family, only a single affected child. There can't be any other um, first degree relatives that are affected. And in about 80% of the families, there was at least one unaffected sibling. Okay, So what this is doing is making the sample simplex-er. So simplex meaning only one affected kid. There's, there's no way to guarantee that these families don't have any other genetic risk. In fact, it's, a, it's guaranteed that they almost all of them do. Um, but what it does do is try to enrich for the situation in which you essentially have a genetic lightning strike that you would be able to find that in these kinds of families. So um, actually, I'm going to go back and just point out this, that the study design that I'm, we're just going to turn the crank on with a, a, a couple different technologies is the first is that it's a really simple experiment. You take the parents and the kids and you compare their DNA based on whatever assay you have. And if you find something in the kids that isn't pre present in the parents, it's either a false positive or a de novo mutation. Right? So there's no fancy statistics here. We just like look at the parents, look at the kid. You know, there's a band that's in the kid that isn't in the parents and we go back and confirm it. Okay, so that is it makes it a really easy way um, to to ask the question about whether de novo or new mutations are contributing to a disorder. The second thing that this allowed us to do is it allowed us to compare kids within a family. Which, for those of you who are geneticists, you realize like what what a great design this is. So I told you that most of the variation in the human genome has nothing to do with disease. It almost all of it is where your grandparents came from. So a huge problem that we have in genetic studies is matching cases to controls for genetic variation. Because it's far more likely if you find a difference between cases and controls that it's a consequence of subtle differences in ancestry that you didn't pick up between the two groups as opposed to really being related to a disorder. 
So when you can compare in a family an affected to an unaffected kid, you, you essentially neutralize that problem because the parents, whatever their ancestry is, um, it, are transmitting that randomly um, uh, to uh, their kids, right? So as long as you do a parent analysis, you're essentially taking the ancestry out of the equation. So the first thing that we did is that we went back and we to um, the findings from Jonathan Sabon and Mike Wigler in 2007. This is Stefan Sanders, who is just um, uh, graduating from the lab now, um, who was the first author on this paper. And we just asked the question, you know, can we find the same thing that they found by looking for new copy number variations in affected kids with autism? And so this was our primary endpoint. Do you, are there more in probands? These are duplications and deletions than there are in their siblings. Um, a really nice experiment. We had, they had 100 kids. We had about 900 at this point, And we got a very striking answer that, yes, we're replicating their result. Um, and you know, some people gave us condolences because you know this is like a replication. Who cares about that? Um, but in psychiatric genetics, like seriously, this is like pop the cork on the champagne moment. Because for so many years, you know, you'd run a, an expanded experiment, and whatever it is that you had found initially disappeared. So we found essentially exactly the same thing that they did. Not only in terms of rate, but we also found that this, these copy number variations were lining up in the genome in the same spots. So we found 16p11, which they and several of the groups had found we were able to kind of um, uh, uh, definitively replicate in this sample that both too much and too little at that part in the genome increases risk for autism and others have found out that it increases risk for a whole variety of neurodevelopmental disorders. We did find one new spot, which we, of course, highlighted in order to get the paper published, um, 7Q1123. And what I want to do for those, you know, this is, again, really calls to Newcastle, but for those of you who don't study monogenic syndromes, I'm, I'm going to play you some video here. Okay, so um, we found one region of the genome, and that region of the genome, if you have too many copies, increases the risk for garden variety autism, so I'm just going to show you a kid with garden variety autism, for those of you who um, uh, have not seen this recently. So um, uh, stereotypic behaviors, the stereotypies, you can tell in about two seconds, I think, as he wanders around the room, that his social relatedness for a 13-year-old boy um, is, is, uh, is, you know, is, is identifiably um, uh, uh, abnormal. Um, and then as the tape goes on, there's no um, uh, uh, sound here. so. It, um, there's nothing to be listening for, but in a moment he'll sit down and he doesn't have useful language. So to, under the old diagnostic criteria, this is you know classic autism. And we found that the kids who had seven Q1123 duplications had one too many copies of the small region of the genome essentially had, you know, classic autism. Now, this is a region of the genome that contains 25 genes, okay? Now, I'm going to show you the, the behavioral phenotype when you lose this identical copy of the genome, and I'm going to turn to my favorite source of scientific information. Can you be born too friendly? I don't mean like a smiling baby. I mean, you can hardly act any other way. Children with no fear of strangers. Meet some kids who I hope fill up your hearts the way they did mine. They're living with a bizarre medical mystery that is a blessing and a curse. Maybe a little bit of hyperbole, but. <laughs> so all I want you to do is, for those of you who haven't seen kids with Williams syndrome, um, this is Williams syndrome. It's a rare deletion syndrome. But just um, uh, notice kind of the, the nature of the social interaction between the children and the interviewer. And for some reason, everybody here wants to So, um, chat to you, buddy. Um, I, I got a title to talk that. Um, so, um, 
The, the reason that I'm showing this, so we have one region of the genome, okay? And when you lose that region of the genome, it pretty reliably looks like this. Talk to anyone who sees a lot of kids with Williams syndrome. This is a pretty highly reliable phenotype of really in, kind of intense interest in, in, in social interaction. They have tons of anxiety, never social anxiety, but tons of anxiety. Um, so, and they also have mild to moderate intellectual disability. They have kind of widely fluctuating cognitive profiles. Um, but, um, but that same region of the genome, when you have a duplication now, we, you know, other labs have now replicated this multiple times, increases the risk for idiopathic autism and increases the risk now we know for schizophrenia as well. And so the reason that we were so interested in this finding is that, remember I told you that this idea that we could get from, you know, sort of molecular level changes in the, in the sequence or structure of the DNA all the way to complex behavior. I think it's a great example that, we, I, at least I hope it is, that we're on the right track, right? Because what you've got are, are two behavioral manifestations, both that share some challenges, you know, around intellectual functioning, but really vastly different kinds of social interaction, really suggesting that there is a way to get all the way from changes at the molecular level to something as complex as affiliation or social behavior, right? Um, and so, uh, so um, we, we hope that this is really a harbinger for what we can do if we can understand what the molecular underpinnings are at even higher resolution. Because you can imagine that if you could get down to a single gene in this interval that was having this kind of impact on social behavior, that that would tell you something really important about the development or maintenance of social um, uh, 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 circuitry in the brain. Um, and that might lead you to the kinds of things that we were hoping for, which would be insight into some um, uh, novel ways of thinking about treatment. But the thing is, is that the problem with copy number variation, even though they're great, is that the resolution typically is not so great. Very often they're just like this, 25 or 30 genes. And for the neurobiologists in the room, you know that the last thing you want is a geneticist coming to you and saying, yeah, I think one or more of 25 genes in this interval might be the thing that you want to model in your lab. And you know, it's, it's a lifetime of work. And so really where you want to be is not at 25 genes, you want to be down to a single gene level. And in 2011, when we published this paper, that wasn't possible, but it very quickly became possible. And it did um, really just, as everything becomes possible in our society because of money. So this is what it costs to sequence all the genes in a single human genome. When I started my laboratory in 1998, this is a log scale, so that's $3 million for a single individual. And then if you look at what's happened, it's falling faster than Moore's law. So in 2014, it's $550 to do the same experiment. And that opened up the door to do exactly the same thing that we did with copy number variation. It's the same sample, same idea, same study design. But now instead of looking at chunks of the genome, we're looking at the letter code of all the genes in the genome simultaneously. And when we did that, we got exactly the same answer. New mutations. New mutations in particular that disrupt the protein that they're supposed to be encoding um, increase the risk for autism. And again, you know, this is sort of my uh, graphical representation of the kind of sea change in psychiatric genetics. Four papers simultaneously hitting nature and neuron all coming up with exactly the same answer. Not only that de novo or new point mutations are increasing the risk for autism significantly, but a number of other things. So we all found that that was the case. We all began to convert on a subset of genes in which there were multiple de novo mutations. And just like in copy number variation, that looked like a way to begin to identify specific genes that were involved. So we, we came up with a list of genes, and these are they for those of you who are interested in individual genes that have come up um, uh, at, at this point in time across all of these studies as, as um, uh, significant in terms of carrying risk. Um, and, uh, and now, actually, we and another group uh, will publish a paper soon that now is up that number to about 25 genes. So again, there's a systematic way to use de novo copy number variation to identify specific genes. So a few other things that we found. In the interest of time, I'm not going to run through the statistics, but I will tell you, people get very skeptical about when I say, oh, if you have two of these de novo mutations, a single gene that gives you a greater than 95% chance that it's associated with autism, three and you're done, it's, it's robust to copy. I mean, to 
to, to the sample size. And just conceptually, this is the reason. The genome is a very big place. In every generation, you get at, at most one shot at the genome in a de novo mutation. Typically, one in 50 of those will lead to a de novo mutation. And as a consequence, you get tremendous statistical power if they start to land in the same spot. Because it really is like saying, what's the chance that lightning is going to land in the same spot in the genome? And as we know, what dictates the likelihood of mutation at any given point in the genome, we can control for that and very quickly identify those regions that are going to turn out to replicate as carrying risk. So we found a couple of other things as well. We can estimate based on the mutation rate how many targets there are in the genome, and our group and several others all landed at about the same order of magnitude, slightly different numbers, but it looks like there are hundreds, maybe a thousand different spots in the genome that are carrying risk. Uh, we all found that the rate of de novo mutation um, increases with paternal age. So older fathers um, are more likely to have de novo mutations. And we found that the vast majority of mutations that, that ended up being in kids with ASD were f of paternal origin. So this is, you know, in total contrast to the refrigerator mother psychodynamic theory of autism. In fact, for this mechanism, which may account for something like 10 percent of idiopathic autism, the vast majority of this is coming from the, the paternal line. And some of that is a consequence of increasing paternal age, not all of it. But for, for people interested in the interaction of genes and environment, right, this is a secular trend, older fathers, clearly leading to an increased genetic risk in de novo mutation, which accounts for some proportion, a small proportion, of increased rates of autism in the population. All right? And then the other thing that we found, or our finding, is that just like with copy number variation, these are genes that are dramatically increasing the risk for autism, but are also increasing the risk for other neurodevelopmental disorders, including there's a paper just a month ago um, showing the overlap with schizophrenia um, and with epilepsy genes. How far that Venn diagram overlaps is still an open question, but it's clear that some of the genetic risk is shared. All right, so in the last 10 minutes, I'm, I'm going to talk with you about sort of where this leaves us. So we've gone from sporadic gene discovery until about 2008, then there was systematic discovery of copy number variation. This has now shifted to systematic discovery of individual genes focusing on de novo mutation. And again, it's not because that's the only important type of mutation, it's the type that gives us the strongest signal to noise um, relationship because there's so few in the normal genome. If we were looking at transmitted variation, we would find 20 or 30,000 rare variants in any one of your genome that would never be seen in anybody else. And so trying to figure out which of those might be the rare event in a child with autism at this point still remains essentially impossible. So it is the fact that these new mutations are so unlikely um, in the general population and are clearly contributing to risk that we're able to do that. All right. So I have to say, when I started in 1998, I, my, my sort of um, intellectual mentor was Rick Lifton, and Rick was a person who was using Mendelian genetics to, to understand um, complex disorder. So he was working in hypertension at the time. He took rare forms of hypertension, was able to find the genes in like one in a million families, actually, and, and you know, Brown and Goldstein gave a pretty good start to this, but you find a gene in a rare family, study its function, can study that in model systems, understand what it's doing in terms of gene expression and function, hopefully elaborate a pathway, and use that to identify treatment targets. And that has been successful in a number of areas of medicine and was really kind of the driving model for my lab. I've shown some version of this slide for 18 years or so. And starting about three years ago, we started to discover individual genes with autism. I started to have an inkling that we had a problem, um, and, and this is the problem. So, um, so we have um, now we think that we have 500 to 1,000 potential targets. So you, first you've got to figure out which ones you want to choose in order to study. The second is, is that when we look at expression and function, almost all these genes have multiple um, uh, varying properties across human development in which they're biologically pleiotropic, some of them leading to like all of biology, as you guys, I think, in this room well know that you, you, know, you end up at protein synthesis or synaptic function or something that is so kind of broad and generic that the idea about how you would use that to target a specific treatment for social disability seems extremely problematic. So we really started thinking about what are we going to do now? Like, it's great. Be careful what you wish for. We've got all of these genes now that are going to come out of this process. 
and a problem in trying to figure out what's the next experiment, how are we going to pursue this, and, and is there a new way to think about moving from gene to biology that isn't take one gene, put it into a model system, find the phenotype. I also kind of realized, you know, sort of in this flash of insight after, you know, being, it was embarrassing after, you know, because I'm a child psychiatrist, is that the model that I gave you on the previous slide, there's like nothing to do with development here, right? I mean, what this presumes is that this is essentially, you know, an ongoing process that doesn't very much so wherever you find it, it's still going to be relevant to the pathology. And of course, and we've, we've got a problem um, in, in autism in that, um, or uh, at least we think that we do, that, um, that, uh, that development it, it, um, is likely to play a really key role in, in, the, in the pathology. This really all came down to a, um, a one sort of seminal moment in the way that the, we were thinking about moving ahead, which is that we had identified um, early on a gene called SCN2A, a sodium channel that we knew had risk for autism, and we knew that the group in Boston had replicated it already pre-publication, so we were super excited. We ran down the hall to a, um, a, a neurobiologist who specializes in sodium channels, thinking, okay, pharma's going to love this. It's a target. We're going to figure out how to use this in order to treat autism. And, and he was like not impressed at all. And he said, you know, it was sort of like calm down, hot shot. Um, he was older than me. Um, when, um, what, this is what I need to know. I need you to tell me um, exactly where to model this. So I need to know the cell type, the brain region, and the point in development in order to, under, to model this. Because if I don't know that, I guarantee you that if I put it into a Purkinje cell, I'm going to get a different, um, a, a different phenotype. Um, than if I put it into a projection neuron, and if I do it early in development, it's going to show one thing, and if I do it later in development, it's going to show another. And so really, in order to answer his question, our lab turned to um, this question. So what we wanted to know was, was there a way to begin to think about using all of the points that we were finding in autism to begin to converge on at least subsets of genes that would tell us when and where do disparate genes that look like they're carrying out many different functions in, in neural development and neural functioning, is there a point where they come together? Because if we could find a point where they came together, then we could go run back down the hall to Steve Waxman and say, OK, we know that our gene is fitting into a network or a process that isn't relevant for this cell type at this point in time. So, can you model that and model the other genes that we think are related to it? And so that's been the work that's been going on in the lab now for, um, for some time, being led by really the most brilliant graduate student I think I've ever met, Jeremy Wilsey, who um, had the idea about, about trying to take a different approach to what we kind of loosely call systems biology. So the systems biology idea would be take all of your different data points and put them together and then see what patterns emerge. And most of the way that's being done in psychiatric genetics right now is to think about pathways, what proteins interact with each other, or do things converge in a signaling, signaling pathway. And Jeremy and a number of members in the lab sat down and thought, you know what, we, I don't think we want to ask about convergence in a single pathway or ask about convergence in protein-protein interaction. It's fine to ask that, but what we really want to know is if our, is there a spatial and temporal dimension to autism risk that transcends sort of what things are directly binding to each other? Because we look through that list of genes that I gave you, those nine genes, like one is a chrom or a couple are chromatin modifiers, one's a transcription factor, another's a sodium channel, another is a, a glutamate receptor subunit, another binds to cytoskeleton, right? So the idea that those independently would come together in a single pathway didn't make sense. But we wondered whether or not they might come together in space and time if we thought thought about them in normal brain development. So in order to do that, and I'm just going to give um, kind of a conceptual overview of this, and then I'm happy to talk in more detail to folks who want that level of detail, is that we took only the genes that had the highest confidence that they were autism genes, and we had nine of them at the time. And then we asked what happened to brain expression across normal human development. So this is not autism brains. There is a database that was being built by our close collaborator, Nenad Sestin, um, that looked at normal development across 15 time periods and across 15 brain regions that were dissected. So what this gave us is a molecular landscape that began to give us some purchase on the question of space and time in gene expression in brain. And then we asked the question, if you take our nine genes, and you look at whether or not they are being expressed, what their patterns are, do those patterns come together in a way that is not expected by chance? So this axis are brain regions that are collapsed. This axis is time. 
And here we asked whether or not there was in evidence for a couple of different things. One is just the degree to which these genes are co-expressed together so that they come together and are more tightly related than you would expect by chance. There, because of time, I, uh, there was another way that we thought about looking for enrichment um, in these networks. But the point was, is there a place where autism genes converge? And we were surprised to find that actually th there were very few, right? So we think that there are a thousand genes. We took nine of them, and I expected, I told Jeremy, not a smart idea. This whole thing is going to be either blank or all of it's going to be pink, right? So that there's no way that you're going to get a single answer out of nine genes. In fact, we were really surprised to see that we only got two really strong signals. This one had enough data for us to pursue. This one we found we thought was preliminary but now actually we have more data to suggest I think that it is in fact a point where au disparate autism risk genes are, are, are functioning together in a way that's more expected than by chance. So this is um, in periods three to um, period six, and that's about 19 to 24 weeks of gestation. So this is mid-fetal gestation. This is just immediately after birth. This region is the prefrontal cortex predominantly, and this is um, the uh, medial dorsal nucleus of the thalamus and the cerebellum. So we found two different spots where the genes that were risk for autism were coming together in a way that was more expected by chance. And what we were able to do with that is we took the de novo mutations, we took the human expression data, we found this network that was really highly enriched, and this is just the example of the prefrontal cortex. But once you have that network, you can begin to ask all kinds of questions about what does that co-expression network define? And in this case, not only did it lead us to mid-fetal prefrontal cortex, but we were able, because of additional data sets, to find that in the cortex that this network was only more connected than expected by chance only in deep layers of cortex. And then we were able to use cell-specific markers in order to identify that that was not relevant for glia. It was only relevant for neurons. So we were able to, these genes, um, and they're all listed here, their expression networks were converging in deep layer of projection, cortical glutamatergic neurons, and mid-fetal development. All right, so now, the point of this is not to say that's where autism resides. The, the point of it is to say, if I want to do an experiment now to see what a functional phenotype might be interesting from one of these genes, and actually the better experiment would be to do multiple of these genes, is that this data is suggesting that there's something convergent about all of these disparate processes in a particular cell type at a particular developmental stage. And so it narrows the range of possibilities in thinking about modeling and looking for a cell or circuit level phenotype that then you could go to pharma with and say, this is something to see whether or not you can correct. All right, so I'm going to end by saying um, a couple things. We, we are you know, absolutely certain that there are going to be multiple expression networks. Um, but I also think that um, a lot of the hand-wringing about heterogeneity and autism spectrum disorders from a genetic standpoint, really it's exactly the opposite. So if you're, if you're studying Huntington's disease, you got one shot <laughs> right, at understanding that biology. And the reality is that for autism now, you know, we've got 25, 26 easily plus syndromic forms. In the next year, they'll easily be 100. And so if it, the, I think the idea that we're going to have multiple cracks at understanding the biology is actually a, a positive thing. I also think that our data suggests that um, what many other people suggest is that it's very unlikely that even if there are a thousand mutations, there are a thousand different ways to get autism um, because these are already pretty much falling out without us doing much into things that, um, that seem much more biologically coherent. So I think it's much more likely that you've got many, many mutations that are falling into a much smaller set of pathways um, uh, underlying the biology. So in addition to our being able now to do systematic gene discovery in autism, I'm, many of you, I'm sure, are aware of the fact that there are, you know, neurobiology is moving along at almost, the, you know, at the identical kind of lightning pace in developing new tools so that we can not only study cellular but also circuit level uh, phenotypes and we can overwrite the genome to model our mutations. So again, the heterogeneity where five years ago would have been like, oh my God, how are you going to make enough mice to do this if you have even more than one gene? Now the idea of doing multiple models simultaneously, I think, is, is well within hand. And I do think that this is setting the stage, hopefully, really for a new era in understanding pathology and treatment. So um, I have to thank all the folks that um, have worked on this over the years. This is Stefan again. That's Nanad Sestin who did the brain span, um, led the 
the brain span effort. And this really has been a collaboration. You know, once we got to the point where we thought oh, we're going to have to do systems biology, there was just no possible way that my lab was going to do that on its own. So we have neurobiology, statistics, and, and some uh, really hardcore chromatin biologists working on this problem. Um, and then I have to thank all of our other collaborators. But particularly, as I said, I've been working on one sample. That sample is a consequence of 3,000 families contributing their time and effort um, uh, uh, to come in and, and be part of the, uh, this genetic study. So I particularly want to thank them. And thank you for your attention. So is an implication of what you were saying that uh, the confidence with which you're going to be able to determine that an individual is at risk for autism is, is increased by having more than one genetic hit. So you were talking about these genes. You were saying if you had two, it goes up. I forget the exact percentage. Great. No, it's a great it question. It goes up. So, so the question yes. is, uh, how does this relate to labs that are trying to do single gene mutations in mice and doing them one at a time? Right. Is, is that the right strategy, or should they be going after more than more than one mutation? So I need to clarify. So what what I was pointing out is that the statistical power of identifying a very rare new mutation in two or three unrelated individuals, a single mutation, two or three unrelated individuals, gives you the power to identify a specific gene that you know that is very very likely to replicate. I wasn't suggesting that those were multiple hits in, in a single individual. Now, interest, but there, there, there's more interesting parts of that question. So the first is, is that there have been these two hit ideas about autism, right? And so it was an obvious or an important question to say, are kids with autism more likely to have two or three lightning strikes you know, um, than other kids? And the fact is, is that no one has found any evidence of that. So it doesn't mean that these are the only thing in those families. And in fact, we think that we're probably, what's happening is that there's a sensitized background. And whether that's genetics or epigenetics or environment, we don't know. But these are not men really Mendelian genes What they're, you know, in terms of their effect. It's not all or nothing. What's happening is that even a single hit is pushing people over you know, sort of the boundary and into um, the area of being affected. But it is not the case that, um, that, kids, that you, you have exactly the same number of double and triple hits that you would expect by chance given underlying mutation rates. The next part of your question, though, is, is it the right strategy to do one at a time? And, and our, our hypothesis is that it's not, and, and at least not without a really strong idea about, about how you're going to try to converge. And, and the reason is, is that if you, you know, any, any model that you have, unless you have an idea about when and where to look in that model and to, and to try to have some other point of convergence, what we're finding is that, the, you know, it just depends on who's looking. It can, you know, it, on whether, you know, the, the number of possible phenotypes, given the wide range of cells in the brain, developmental stages, you know, regional specificity, et cetera, that's very hard to know. You know, even if you see like a, a deficit in long-term potentiation and you know in a neural ligand three mouse, like whether or not that has anything to do ultimately with the, the pathology, I think in isolation is a very hard question to answer. So I do think you know, it's not that the individual ones are not going to be important, but I think thinking about it in a systems way is going to be key to understanding the pathology. Uh, I'm thinking about the autism ep epidemiology and the dramatic increase in prevalence over the last decades. Yes. And I wonder if rare variants are the underlying cause of most autism cases. Where is the, what's driving the increase in uh, rare variant frequency in the population? Great. So um, you guys could all hear the question. A couple things. The first is is that I really want to um, underscore the fact that that this is a gene discovery strategy that had nothing to do with overall population contribution of rare variation. We will be lucky if we explain 10% of autism by looking for rare variation. Uh, you know, of the con you know, say with point mutations. The reason that I'm focusing on it is because it's a point of traction right now that other types of variation are not giving us, um, in part because of sample size and just signal and noise problems. So even though I focused on it, it doesn't, I'm not, it, it, what I'm focused on is its entree into biology and not its explanatory power for population risk. In fact, when we look at common variation, it looks like common variation in the populations explains probably more risk than rare variation depending on the family structures. So that's one thing. The, the second is is that even though within 
um, within rare variation. So even if we're explaining 10 or 15 percent by rare variation, as I pointed out in the talk, we can already see that once you know that that's a mechanism, you can start to ask questions about what influences that mechanism. So we already know paternal age does, right? But you could also ask the question, what environmental exposures might also increase the risk in fathers for de novo mutation? I guarantee you that things that we you know, would be interested in, cigarette smoking, alcohol, all kinds of things, could potentially increase the rate of de novo mutations in fathers. Um, and, and what this gives you, I think, is a way of doing in an epidemiological cohort, right? You can ask the question, what's correlated with the rate of de novo mutation in my epidemiological sample in a way that I think helps to get, you know, to, to link um, in, in environmental factors with a specific genetic mechanism that's clearly related to autism risk. So I think it opens up some doors to answer some additional questions about environmental exposures, but it's not going to explain the dramatic increase in autism. Um, and the final thing is, is that you have to be careful about talking about dramatic increases in autism because it's clear that a tremendous amount of the reported increase is a consequence of changing diagnostic criteria and changes in ascertainment. Um, even when you try to control for all of that, it still looks like there is an increased rate if you're really conservative about the diagnosis. Um, and, but that rate of increase is much, much smaller than the you know, hundredfold increase in risk that is purported um, uh, in um, you know, the press, et cetera. So uh, you mentioned that approximately 40% of the cases of autism are in the context of syndromic uh, monogenic conditions. And good examples of those are fragile X and uh, does that work? Fragile X and threat syndrome, and yes. 2 um, From your data, have you actually observed any signals around those genes that increase the predisposition? For idiopathic autism? Idiopathic. Yeah. So the 30 to 40 percent, I just would want to clarify. So that's the diagnostic yield for in, among medical geneticists in retrospective studies of kids that are referred for quote unquote idiopathic autism. You would imagine that those would be enriched for certain types of cases. So higher functioning kids, certainly in every clinic that I've been in, would be much less likely to get a referral than kids with severe intellectual disability to a medical geneticist. That's changing, but I think that that data in part reflects an ascertainment bias. And then the number include both karyotypes, so um, uh, CNV analysis, so 16P11, and the other things that we've identified, as well as monogenic syndromes. So that's just to clarify those numbers. Um, the question about whether or not we see a signal. So um, we have not seen a signal with regard to, say, de novo mutations at Fragile X, at FMRP. What we have seen is a whopping signal. If you look at all the genes that we've identified, and then you ask sort of what are characteristics of these genes, the thing that flies lies in your face is that they're all FMRP targets. Not all of them, but it's dramatically enriched compared to brain express genes or any other set. That there's something about FMRP that is real, and that's why you know. So this early insight about FMRP and autism that that it, there's definitely a convergence around idiopathic versus monogenic forms. It, it it seems like in the biology, which again I think is a really positive sign because this hand wringing about oh my God there are a thousand mutations they've all got to be doing something different and we're going to have to have a single you know a different treatment for each kid. I think it is really unlikely, and I think that progress that's going to be made both on the monogenic side and on the idiopathic side is very likely to end up um, in, in a similar biology. So in this case, it appears that autism is developmental pathway disease, right? Because all these genes, although they are sodium channels or cytoskeleton proteins, but they are well, that's that's a, right. So I think so. Same. I would I, vote for that. Not everyone believes that, right? right? I mean, there's this now. There's this interesting argument in the field, right? Because of some of the rescue, mm -hmm. um, you know, MECP2 and other rescues. There's a group of people who believe that it's all cell biology and that you don't need to know anything about development. And then, you know, but and I don't fall into that. I mean, I think that I I I, I hope that part of what they're saying is right. That there are ongoing functional deficits, but we're obviously really focused on what's the developmental context for these insults. Right. Thank you. The, um, you know, changes that you mentioned, whether genes have been identified by GWAS, although not very many, not for autism, yes. uh, yeah. or by looking at the transcript levels of different genes or uh, copy number variation or genes that are associated with uh, autism, like fragile X or tuberous sclerosis, that we actually can account for about 30 percent 
25, 30 percent of the autism cases? I, so I think, again, I think that, that um, if, if that a, a, a medical geneticist would answer with a yes and a child psychiatrist would answer with a no. And, and the reason that it's a no for a child psychiatrist is that we, I think we, we would see a much broader range of kids and that our diagnostic yield would be lower. So in the Simon Simplex collection, for instance, you know, this, it had a tendency, as many studies that we do, you know, research studies that we do have a tendency to bias towards higher functioning kids um, because they're easier to have, to, particularly if you're making people travel, right? So you've got a family, you're asking them to travel, um, you're asking them to participate in long diagnostic assessments. And, and the Simon Simplex Collection was incredibly rigorous about diagnoses. And so when you look at the IQ of that sample, right, it's, it's certainly higher than you would see in, um, in, a, a, in a medical genetics clinic, I think substantially higher. And when we look in that population, the, the yield for a chromosomal microarray was about, you know, in our research studies was about 7%. The yield for Fragile X was very low in that sample. Um, it was a rule out. If you had Fragile X, you were pulled out, but only a handful of kids were, were pulled out. I think in part because the detection prior to enrolling in the study was probably very high. So I think it really depends on what sample you're looking at. And no one has done this on an epidemiological sample to really answer what that distribution truly is in the population. But it's just because, you know, looking at what is the next strategy, I mean, what yes. is molecular that you can, uh, you know, f f uh, follow to identify more individuals that have, a fra uh, have a autism or yes. the genetic cause? Yes. So we were very excited about when the CNV came out. Right. Because, but then when you really look at the a contribution is not that high. Right. So we, in, we, in can, terms of population frequency. we can explain only a small variance. So the majority of the autism cases, we still don't know what really the genetic cause is. Yes. So even with the sequencing, I mean, the sequencing identifies so many variants, but how do we know which is the variant that actually has the significance as far as, you know, uh, leading to that phenotype. Okay, so there are multiple questions there. So, I'll, and, and so, I'll, um, uh, but all really important. So the first is, is that um, it, right now, um, given uh, sort of the, the, our abilities and sample sizes, the only way to identify mutations that are associated with autism right now reliably um, is at least to lead with de novo mutation discovery because of the properties of de novo mutation. And you can get some additional data by doing other kinds of sequencing studies, but essentially we've got one kind of lamppost that we can look under. So the answer to your question about, you know, you look across the genome, you find a whole bunch of variation. How do you know what's relevant to autism? Right now, the way to know is if you can identify de novo mutations that are cause a loss of function in that gene, and that will lead you to be able to identify more and more. So, but I don't think that that's your underlying question. I think your underlying question is, so even if we're able to do that, and we can estimate what the overall population contribution will be, so when we get to about 10,000 patients, we should be able to explain, based on what we've seen with mutation rates, we should be able to explain probably 20 to 25 percent of autism, so a quarter of kids who would come into a clinic based on our understanding of mutation that comes as a consequence of these de novo studies, whether it's CNV or sequencing. But the underlying question, I think, is, so if you know that, what can you do with it? Because still, if they're all individual mutations, you can't generate any statistical power by saying, okay, I've got four kids with CHD8 mutations, can I understand what a good treatment is? I mean, you know, you, you could do that in your clinic, but a drug company isn't going to do that, right? So the issue is, how do we know whether or not these are generalizable? And I think the first thing is what we were just talking about, that in the Fragile X example, I think what you're finding is that it's unlikely that they're all pointing in different directions. That we're already seeing that they seem to be pointing to things that transcend the type of mutation. So even if you're only explaining 20 25% on de novo, the fact that they're all pointing to some mechanism having to do with Fragile X makes it really unlikely to me that, that, you know, that it's only going to be that group. And that there, there are going to be some broader principles. There may be you know, a glutamatergic autism Autism. There may be a Fragile X-related autism, but they're going to fall into groups in which you would be able, if you knew how to put that group together, to get sufficient statistical power to answer important questions. And I think we're already headed that way. I mean, yeah. Right, and then just last yeah. one. Uh, this is kind of a biased comment because I've been working on Fragile X. That's okay, X, all right? of my answers are biased as well. So. <laughs> I've been working on Fragile X for many years, so I know 
you know, the importance of uh, FMRP right. uh, as a synaptic protein. So if you think there are like, I don't know, 2,000 proteins at the synapses, yes. then you can understand how a mutation in any of them that interact with FMRP can lead to autism. Uh, so that Yeah, you can say that, but really knowing what that means is another question, right? right. So, but I think that that's, so I, I do think that that's the point though, is that, um, that um, you can, there's a glass half full and a glass half empty approach to that kind of question. So the glass half full is, there are 2,000 synaptic proteins, a bunch of them bind to fragile X, and so how are we ever gonna dissect that? And the glass half full, did I just say half full? I meant half empty. The glass half full version is, in fact, if you, if you are, can, be, if, if you can begin to understand where you should look for a convergent cellular or circuit level phenotype among disparate mutations that are all leading to an identifiable, quantifiable phenotype, that that opens the door to, to therapeutics development. And, and so, it, you know, it's, time is going to tell whether or not, you know, it's so dispersed and so impossible that even with gene discovery, we're never going to be able to do bottom-up therapeutics. And there are plenty of people right now who are, who are saying, you know, look, gene discovery, it's so heterogeneous, you're toast. You're never going to get anywhere. And our answer is, well, you know, there seems to be kind of a, a pattern that's forming even with the, this initial foray into gene discovery. We're about a year into systematic <laughs> gene discovery and autism. So give us three or four, and then let's see whether or not it's identifying mechanisms that might be targetable and, and generalizable. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.